Hello, hello, everybody. Am I coming in loud and clear? Can you smash that chat button? Hello, Dijant. Anubhav, hello. Music, no time this morning, Nathaniel. Um, um, uh, Anubhav, maybe next time, maybe the 12 o'clock. Hello, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I hope you're having a, a great day. If you're in Sydney, it's Freedom Day. Um, so I've been curious to ask people, what are you doing with Freedom Day? Maybe I should ask the people who aren't here. They're definitely enjoying their Freedom Day. Anyway, um, I see, yeah, we're all a bit sleepy, Carl. Can you see in the background, I've got new plushies. Anybody recognize this, this thing? Whoop. It, it might be a spider. It looks like a spider. Anyway, we've got a quokka riding a spider. If you know what it is, let me know in the comments. Um, yes, Jen Wu, you are correct. It is from Minecraft. Well spotted. Um, most important information today, at 12 o'clock noon, Sydney time, there is a Mobius revision tutorial. So join me and we will talk about some questions. Um, in today's lecture, we're going to look at more about inverse uh, functions, but we're going to look at the trigonometry type of functions. And the second part is about these parameterized curves. So you've already seen some of these things in algebra, believe it or not. Okay, ouch. Um, and and, and it, these things might be familiar, but we, we're going to you know do some um, differentiation. And the the most interesting or, or, or difficult part of this is the domain of the range. Okay, so um, we'll talk about lots of examples. We'll talk about these kinds of functions. And there's some calculus and this sort of stuff, it should be kind of familiar um, because you've seen some of this in uh, in algebra with parametric uh, lines and parametric uh, planes. But we're going to look at the curve, so not necessarily linear type functions, okay? And they're, they're really, really interesting. Um, and you can do a lot with with the parametric parametric stuff, okay? All right, so we are going to build on the last lecture that we had about inverse functions, okay? And probably the, the, the most challenging part in this part is the relationship between the domain and the range of trig functions and their inverses. And we'll be looking at sort of differentiation, okay? So one of the, the really difficult um, things with trig functions is the following. If you look at, say, the sine curve, right? So this is like the sine curve, right? It's not a one-to-one -one function. Everywhere. All right. So the, the the one of the reasons is if you draw a horizontal line, then it crosses the the curve um, at many places. Okay. So you could think that oh well, th th there isn't an inverse function, but we know from high school maths that there definitely is. So what we're going to do is we're going to restrict the domain to an interval where the function is one-to-one. -one. So we're going to tighten up this domain and just work with it with an interval, okay? Um, so for example, you can see, say, from here to here, this part of the curve is definitely one-to-one, -one. okay? So that part's one-to-one. -one. And so um, we'll, we'll just restrict the domain to certain intervals. And the same with cosine um, uh, and, and the inverse of that, okay? 
All right. So if you can remember from um, last lecture, these are some really important relationships between the domain and the range of the function and its inverse. So to calculate four things, you only need two, which is really nice. Okay, so let's start off with some of the well-known basic trig functions and we'll talk about their, um, their inverse, okay? So what we're gonna do with sine is restrict it to this interval because it's one to one there. And what we're going to do with cosine or cos is restrict it to that interval, okay? So on both of these intervals, our functions are one-to-one -one functions, okay? So drawing on that and this relationship, this is how we define the two inverse functions. So let me um, bring up GeoGebra because it looks pretty good when we, when we look at things in GeoGebra and um, I'll show you what's going on. All right, so if I put in, say, the sine function and restrict it to the interval negative pi on 2 to positive pi on 2, you can see that function definitely passes the horizontal line test, right? And so um, if I put in the inverse by reflecting it, in the line y equals x, there is our inverse function, okay? So there's the function and there's the inverse function, okay? It's just reflected in the line y equals x, okay? And similarly, for the cosine function, let's get rid of that. So you can see here between, say, 0 and um, uh, pi, you can see that that function or the graph definitely passes the horizontal line test. And so I can put in the inverse function by reflecting it in the line y equals x. So that's it. Now, you can see with both of the inverse functions, you know, they go like you can see the blue curve, the domain is negative one to one. And the range is from negative pi on 2 to pi on 2. And the same with the other curve. The, um, the domain is negative 1 to 1. And the range is 0 up to pi. Okay? So they're, they're really um, nice ways of looking at the, at the graphs and their inverse. Remember, you can always reflect a function's graph in the line y equals x to get the inverse function, right? So there's some nice symmetry or reflection. What about the tan function? I hear you ask. Well, we can have a look at that. Bup, 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 bup. So um, here we, we uh, I've got less than or equal to, it probably should be less than, um, but um, uh, yeah, probably not. Let me just fix that up. Better. Okay. And what about the inverse function? Well, that's, you can see the blue curve definitely passes the, the horizontal line test. And so you kind of should see where, where the inverse is going to go. Bop, 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 bop. Okay. Da, da, da. So there you go. So, so they are the main functions for your um, tan inverse, uh, cos inverse, and um, sine inverse. Okay. So um, remember when we are um, when we are plotting these or picturing them in our mind, we can always draw the original function, restrict its domain and then reflect it in the, um, in the line y equals x. Okay, so back to my um, document camera. So they're the two things there. And then I've just noticed these should be, I've got less than or equals to here. They should just be, they should be like that. And therefore, they're going to be like that. Okay, so just touch those up in your notes. I'll, I'll put a corrected version on, um, 
on Moodle. Okay, it's the first time I've used these notes, so there, there will be little, little bugs here and there. So I apologize for that. Okay, so that's a little bit about um, functions and their inverse when it comes to trig functions. Um, we're going to use some useful properties in um, calculating uh, various quantities, right? So there are three important symmetry type properties that you'll see. The first one is this. Okay, so what does this mean? It means the inverse sine function is an odd function. Okay, so what does the what does the odd function mean? Well, it means that if you took the graph and you rotated it 180 degrees about the origin, you would get the same graph. Okay, so you that, 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 that's that's a good test to to see whether a function's odd or not. Okay, this one too, it's an odd function. And this middle one, it kind of looks like um, an even function, but you've got this pi in here. So I'll just put even in brackets. Okay, you've got this sort of pi extra uh, term of pi there. So it's not really satisfying the definition of an even function, but but there there will be some sort of symmetry um, um, there. Okay. All right. So. We're going to use these when we actually um, look at uh, some uh, some basic problems. So why don't we go and do that, and we can um, we can actually uh, see how this is used. And it's it like th these problems here that they look pretty simple, but um, they're actually not that simple if you don't know what to do. Okay, so let's you'll see these in your tutorial problems. Let's um see if we can if we can work through them so so these are some of the key considerations and also these things as well so what is the domain of sine inverse what is the domain of cos inverse those, those sorts of things okay all right so I'm, I'll, I'll start at the top here so i'm going to we want to compute the in cos inverse of one on root two so I'll let um, Z be the answer that we want. Okay. Now we know from the uh, the definition of cosine inverse that Z has to be between zero and pi. So in other words, it has to be positive and well. Well, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to pi. All right. Okay. So, um, how can we do this? Well, one way is to say, okay, well, let's take the cosine of both sides. And we'll get something like this. Right? Who can tell me what, I mean, this is a very simple case in the chat. Who can tell me what is a number Z that when you take the cosine of it gives you one on root two? Pi on four, right. Okay. Is Z between zero and pi? Yes. So it fits in there properly. So we, we're pretty happy with that. That's a pretty easy question. Okay, but now it start it gets a little bit harder. Okay, we haven't used any of these things yet, but but let's let's see what um what we can do. So that's a sort of a standard entry level one. So in the second one, we want the inverse sine of negative one half. Whoops. Okay, and we know that the range of sine is between negative pi on two and positive pi on two. 
Okay. All right. So one way of, of, of doing this is now we can invoke um, this thing here. So we can take the minus sign out of the, the um, argument here. And um, we know that that's the case because sign inverse is an odd function. Okay, so we've used the first thing there on this one. Okay, so what is sine inverse of one half? What's the angle there? Anyone know in the chat? We, if we can find out sine inverse of that, what is it? Yeah, it's pi on six, so negative pi on six. All right. Is that in this in this output? Yes, no problem. That fits in there nicely. Thank you, Maximilian. Okay. So now it starts getting a bit harder. So these are two sort of entry level problems, but let's actually um, see where where this takes us. Okay. So now I want sine inverse of sine. <clears throat> All right. So the tempting thing here, and this is a, the mistake that a lot of students make. They go, oh, the inverse and the function cancel. So it's just 3 pi on 4, but 3 pi on 4 is not in this interval. So it doesn't make sense. Okay? So don't, don't be fooled by that. When you take the inverse of this, you can't just cancel them out because 3 pi on 4 is in here. Okay? That's not in the range of the sine inverse function. So, so there's a problem. Okay, so you can do this a number of ways. One way is to just draw in the angle, right? So you can go 3 pi on 4 over there, that angle. Is going to be pi on 4, right? So Who can tell me what can I replace sine three pi on four with? Anyone know? So cos is positive, they're all positive there, sine's positive in this quadr quadrant and tan positive. Yes, Aria, thank you. Okay. So now, oh, pi on four is in that interval. Yes, yes. Okay. Whew. So now we can actually um, uh, eliminate those two things, and uh, that's in our in our range, which is great. Okay. Uh, Oh, all right. Hang on a second, everyone. Minnie, come here, girl. Come here. Minnie, come here. Come here. Okay. Oh, my little poochie. Let me just kill that. I just want to show you to the class. Hey, this is my new dog. It's a little little puppy. Hey, how are you? Come on. You want to say hello? Hey, it's a it's a half schnauzer, half poodle. Doggo, doggo, doggo. Yes. All right. They're saying hello. Yeah, puppets. All right. So I'm going to take you back now. Just give me a second, everyone. All right, Papa gone. Oh, that's your dog. Nice one, Bill. So what's yours? What is it looks like a bit uh, what is it? A King, King Charles Cavalier or something? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, nice. 
I've got another two. Oh, oh I can see another one. Oh, puppies. Uh, freedom Day, more like I'll a let you go. Happy day. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, okay, so back to the back to the program, everyone. So um, we just had to manage this a little bit to get to make sure we were mindful that you know any output for sine inverse has to be in here in this interval, right? All right. Again. cos inverse of cos 3 pi on 4, okay? So let's consider that. All right. So, oh, sorry, it's a little messy. All right. So who can tell me 3 pi on 4, is that between 0 and pi? Yes, it is. So can I just cancel these out? Who can tell me yes or no on the chat? Russell says no. Aria, yes, correct, I can. Right, why? Because this is in here. Okay. Now the other way to do it, if you if you're worried about it, you could just use um, um, maybe this middle one. But I, I don't think it's necessary for this one. So you can kind of see a pattern going on here. Hopefully, you're you're really looking hard at the domain and especially the range of these inverse functions. Okay. And if they don't, if it's not where you want it to be, you can always draw a graph or simplify to get it to where you want it to be. Now, um, the last one is a, is an interesting one because it uses cosine and an inverse of sine. So these ones they're sort of you know pretty much the same, but this one is different. Okay, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about this one, um, and then and then move on. All right, so. Um, we want the cosine of sine inverse of 3 on 7. So I'm going to let, say, theta be inverse, sine inverse of 3 on 7. Okay? And we know that this theta has to be between negative pi on 2 and 2. That's just for the, you know, the, the output to make sense, right? Okay, so we can use this relationship, okay? Now, I'm including the plus or minus there for completeness. It turns out you just need the positive square root. I'll tell you why that's true in a minute, okay? But, but this is strictly better than just writing the square root sign without the, the, the positive or negative, okay? All right. So if theta is that, sine theta must be 3 on 7. So I can take that and put that in here. So it's going to be um, 9 on 49. I think that's correct. And so you simplify this you're going to get something like 40 on root 49. Okay, so um, 2 root 10 on 7. Okay, so now the, the question is, do I want the positive thing for this or the negative? Um, thing. Well, you want the positive thing. Why? Because this is going to be less than pi on 2. Okay. So we want the positive, positive value, okay? If you look at the graph of cosine, 
you know that it's non-negative for, for say um, uh, this um, uh, between negative pi on two and pi on two. So this is enough. Okay, so what is the actual answer? I'm glad you asked. There it is. Okay, so let me put it in up there. Okay, so that went from the pretty easy to the intermediate to the slightly more involved and more difficult. Okay, so, so you sort of need to be across all of those um, in uh, for these kinds of things. But the most important advice that I can give is look for alignment with the range and the domain. And then sometimes you can use these nice properties to help you out and simplify, okay? You can also simplify in other ways just by drawing pictures and whatnot, okay? Okay. All right, so let me, yeah, so you should have that now. So one of the super interesting things here is that for all x, you have these kinds of relationships. So you can always take the sine of sine inverse and the cosine of, of cosine inverse and whatnot, and they all cancel out. But when you go the other way, you just need to think about domain and ranges. Okay? All right. So on that tip, let's have a look at the next question. Sketch the graph of this function and identify its domain and its range. So um, it, it's, it's pretty easy to do if you have the graphing technology, right? Um, what you can do if you don't, you can basically just look at, so this is a sine inverse function. You can look at this function and go, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to start with that and try to modify it to that. But let's have a look at a, at a picture because it's, it's much easier to look at a picture. All right, so... Let me go over to GeoGebra, you guessed it. So if I put in sine inverse, bah, 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 can you see what's happened? Our function is up there, our new function. Our domain has been squashed, right? Let me zoom in a bit. Our domain has been squashed and our range has been stretched okay so the the domain has been um squashed by a factor of two and the range has been squashed uh, 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 stretched by a factor of two okay so instead of the um the a domain being negative one to positive one the domain is going to be negative a half to positive a half for the green function and instead of the range being um uh, negative pi on two to pi on two, it's going to be negative pi to pi. Okay. So let's have a look. All right. The, let's call this G, G of X. Okay, so it's going to be... Um, negative a half to a half. And this is from our, our picture. Okay. Bop, bop, bop. Yeah. All right. So there it is. Okay. All right, so a little bit of calculus with inverse trig functions. You might have seen these before. Let me know in the chat who who has seen these kind of formulae before. Put put yes if you have and no if you haven't. Let me know because the chat's gone a little bit quiet since all the puppies. I can't compete with puppies, right? Um, if you've seen these before, let me know. You might have seen them. If you haven't seen them, don't worry. Russell, it's not, it's not important to have seen them before, right? That's okay. I'm glad some of you have seen them. 
Okay, I Chen, that's fine. Nai Peng, that, that is fine, not a problem. Um, remember, this is a calculus part of the of the course, so we want to look at derivatives, integrals, those sorts of things. Um, you can use the chain rule to justify these sorts of things, right? So, you know, you start off with this sort of thing on the left-hand side. Oh, sorry. Let me um, fix that up. You, you, you start with something like this, ddx of... sine of sine inverse of x equals this. Okay, so you use the chain rule here for differentiation. This becomes the one, right? And then you just divide, okay? So that's where, for example, this one comes from. Okay, now you don't have to prove that. But um, that's just sort of some basic idea of, of where it comes from. You can use this. We saw this, or just the chain rule. It's up to you. Okay, so note that these are sort of the negatives of each other, which is pretty interesting. Okay, you know that there's a derivative. Um, you know, if you differentiate sine, you get cosine, and cosine, you get negative sine. Well, if you differentiate the inverses, they just um, differ by, um, by a negative sign. Okay, so let's um, see what we can do here. Let's compute some derivatives and um, we can uh, then move on to um, parametric curves, which are super, 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 super interesting. All right, you've got two equations or two functions, compute the derivative for each of them. Okay, so. In the first one, we've got cosine inverse. In the second one, we've got sine inverse. This is a product, and this is a composition of functions, right? So for the first one, let's use the chain rule. And for the second one, we'll use the product rule, OK? So let's apply the chain rule. Okay, so when we're doing this, it's usually easy to set the inside function to be something like your u function. So I'm going to let u be that. So u is going to be expressed in terms of x. So we want two derivatives for the chain rule, dy du and du dx. Okay, so dy du going up here is going to be negative one on root one minus u squared. Okay, so that's the first one, du dx. is going to be, well, they're both power functions. So you'll get something like that. So the chain rule tells us we multiply these two derivatives together and that gives us our answer. So by the chain rule, So you've got something like this. Remember the so this is a u here. So so that's y dx. Now you see it. Now you don't. Now you see it. Now you don't. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So that's a u. So you're going to get this over here times all of this. And what we would like to do is express this all in terms of x. Okay. So we can take this substitution back and put that into there. Okay. Da, 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 da.
Done. Okay. I'm not going to. Um, oh well. Uh, or squared. Sorry. Cool. Okay. I'm not going to simplify that. I think that's fair enough. And for part B, you've got a product. So let's um, apply the product rule. So um, how did I do it? Yeah, I'll let that be U and that be V. Okay, you know the product rule tells you if I want to differentiate a product of two functions, I just um, can apply a certain formula, right? So that's the derivative of that. So if u equals the natural log of x and v equals sine inverse x, then let's work out their two products. Who can tell me what's the derivative of natural log of x on the chat? Who can tell me? One on x. Russell, yes, you rule. Thank you, Aria. And the, the derivative of this, well, we have it up here in our little table. So um, uh, 1 on root 1 minus x squared squared. Okay, so let's put these four things together, and then we've got our derivative. So by the product rule. All right, the derivative is just that times that plus that times that. Okay, so it's so that times that plus that times that. Da, 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 da. Puppy power, we did it. Okay. Whew. All right. Don't worry, people. In about 10 minutes, there'll be freedom from maths on this Freedom Day. Okay. Don't worry. The freedom is coming. Okay. So. Let's move on to parametric curves. Now, parametric curves are amazing. And the, 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 the questions and the level of difficulty for these things are not, are not too difficult. Okay? So some people, you know, they don't like trigonometric things and they get bored very easily. And I can understand that. But these things are amazing, right? So um, let me... Um, you already probably know what a parametric curve is, but the the, the main advantage is they can do more than this basic y equals f of x type type model. Okay, so in in the parametric form, you have a parameter. Okay, so in this case, t is the parameter. And what happens is, as you vary this parameter, the points in the plane or the, the xy plane change. Okay, So you sort of have a set of points here that depends on this parameter t. Okay, So let me give you an example um, in GeoGebra, what this might look like. Now, you, like I said, you have seen this in um, in algebra but here's one here okay so that's a parameterized curve x is t squared plus t and y is t minus one right so you can see that is not a function can someone tell me on the chat why is this not a function why is this not a function Why can't you write it in the in the terms y equals f of x? Nathaniel, yes, it fails the vertical line test. Thank you. Happy Freedom Day. All right. So that definitely fails the vertical line test. Here's another one. 
x equals cosine t, y equals sine t. That definitely fails the vertical line test. It cannot be a function, right? Okay. So there are a couple of examples of um, things that these para parametric um, expressions can do, but regular functions like that cannot do. Okay. All right. So um, with respect to calculus, let's look at the derivative, right? So if you want to differentiate the curve, Um, for functions, Russell, I, I'm just trying to, like, th this is a function if it passes the vertical line test, okay? These things don't necessarily pass the vertical line test, okay? So th these can do things that this can't. The horizontal line test um, is something different, Russell. Okay, that, that's more for like one-to-one -one functions and inverses and stuff like that. But it's a good, it's a very good question. So let's say we wanted to differentiate, find the slope of the tangent line to these curves, right? What this says is that you can differentiate both of these things with respect to the parameter and then divide that dx, sorry. Okay, so you've got one derivative up there, one derivative down there, you um, divide them and by the chain rule, you get the uh, the dx dt, a uh, dy dx. Sorry. All right. So let's do a couple of examples. Bump, bump, bump. <clears throat> this is the example that I just put up in GeoGebra. Okay. So it's like a it's like a curve that that goes like this, right? It's sort of it's like a parabola that's on its side. Okay, all right, so let's differentiate these two parts and then we'll combine them in this way. We're also asked to compute the value of the derivative at the point. These are x points here. x equals zero, y equals negative one. All right, so this is not a hard question because it just builds on something that you already know. So dx dt is going to be 2t plus 1, hey. And to y dt is a constant, it's going to be 1. So the derivative is just going to be this, which is 1 over. 2t plus 1. Now, you can leave that in terms of t if you want to. You can also write it back in terms of x and y if it's possible. Okay? So if you want to get it back in terms of x and y, you can use this to, to isolate t, and then we can write it in terms of um, y. So we're going to get 2y plus 3. Okay, so when x equals 0 and y equals negative 1, you can just put that in there and you finish the question. Okay, so y equals negative 1. So that'll be negative 2. So there you go. Okay, so not, not, not a difficult question by any, um, any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so, so that would be the slope of the tangent line to the
curve at um, at this point here. Okay. All right. Um, what about this one here? So I just showed you this in GeoGebra. So that's actually going to be a circle, right? Because you can actually eliminate the T's So you're going to get x squared plus y squared equals 1, which is the unit circle. So when I say unit circle, it means it's got a radius of 1. And you've got a center at the origin. Okay, great. So let's compute the derivative. We've actually... Um, We've actually computed the, the simple curve, right? So it's a circle. Okay, so let's let's differentiate this, differentiate this, and we can then put them together. Okay, so to y dt, dx dt, let's do the um, division and this is our very last problem. Okay, so dy dt is given by cosine t. Uh, dx dt is given by negative sine t. Okay, so that's um, one way of, of computing it. You can also then get back to, you know, x is cosine t, y is um, sine t. So that's it written in terms of x and y. That's it written in terms of t. The last question is what point corresponds to t equals pi on 2? Okay, so a pi on 4, sorry. So x is going to be cosine pi on 4. y is going to be sine of pi on 4, which is also 1 on root 2. Yep. So the point is... Okay. Now, if you if you look carefully and you think about it, what you might say, what does T represent here? Well, I am glad you asked because in this case, you can think of T as representing the angle to the positive x-axis. So when the angle is pi on 4, you're going to be at the point 1 on root 2, 1 on root 2. Ba, 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 ba. That's it. All right, folks. Um, so parameterized curves are not particularly um, um, difficult. The calculus is pretty easy. You're just differentiating and applying chain rule and formulae like this. Note that these kind of functions can do things that these can't. And it helps to draw a picture. All right? So I'll leave you with that. Any questions, any comments, uh, let me know. You, uh, let me. I just might turn the microphones on. Let me just see if, this, if everyone's got their mic. Okay. So people can share if they want to chat, if they want to celebrate Freedom Day here in Sydney, um, just let me know.
And if I don't hear from you, hopefully I'll see you at the 12 o'clock um, tutorial for some Mobius, some Mobius. So let me know people what is going on in the chat. Let me know if you have questions, comments, observations, but thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you um, at the next tutorial or next lecture. Yay, freedom, freedom, freedom. Thank you, Russell. Enjoy. I always enjoy your questions. Thank you, Nathaniel. Shakira, Shakira. Thank you. Aiden and Alan, thank you. Carl. Nai Peng, thank you. Hope to see you a bit later. Thanks, Nicholas and Jun Sheng. Maximilian. Dijan, thank you. Ai Chen, thank you. Aria, love your picture. It's so cool. See you in the tutorial. All right, I'm signing off if no one has any questions.